T'es prête? Euh, oui. Excellent. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Talk to Danielle podcast. I am your host, Danielle C. Baker. And before we start on today's topic, uh, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to whichever channel you're watching or listening to. And something new this season, because we are in season two, this episode is brought to you by the self-esteem doctor, the wonderful Dr. Simone Alicia. Uh, so I invite you to have a look at her online academy. I would never um, talk about, you know, put and mention uh, programs unless I really believed in it. And this is wonderful if you want to help your children develop their self-esteem, uh, their confidence. She has amazing programs for children, for teens, and even for adults. Sometimes we need that help too. So I will mention, uh, I will put the link in the description and the comments below and be sure to, to have a look at it. There are a lot of resources on the Self-Esteem Doctor Online Academy. So today I have an amazing guest. I know I say that every time, but they really are all amazing. But the, the person that we're introducing today is, uh, is a colleague. Uh, we are both in the world of early childhood education. Uh, she does amazing work. I, I love all of the work that she does and I'm really excited to have her on. We'll talk Uh, we'll be talking a lot on uh, with the wellness in children and that today. But uh, today I have the wonderful Melanie McDonald. Thank you so much, Melanie, for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Danielle. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Now, uh, I always have long introductions, but uh, do you want to give us just briefly to share your story with us and how you got to, to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've been working uh, with children and in the field for about 15 years at this point, but really, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, been working with children, I feel like my whole life. Uh, I uh, originally have a, a child and youth worker uh, diploma from Collège Boreal and worked in that field for a few years. I had worked in daycares all through college and even in high school um, and summer camps and those kinds of things. So got to start probably my first time working with kids at about 15, maybe even 14 years old. Um And so at the, once I graduated uh, from Child Youth Worker, I worked at actually Children's Aid and Child Welfare for a few years before uh, ending up in the Best Start Hubs, uh, worked there for many years. And uh, eventually, you know, the early childhood education uh, just kept coming back. It just kept coming back. So I ended up going to get a set, my second diploma in early childhood education and uh, tried out, you know, a supervisor position for a while and uh, eventually made my way to where I am today as a facilitator. Uh, I do, I offer workshops and create resources for the French uh, part of early childhood education in Ontario. So that's kind of how I got here. Uh, <laughs> I'm also a mom and a wife and a sister and a cousin. And I feel like I've always kind of taken care of kids since as long as I can remember. So their development and the way they think and all of that is very, yeah. very I'm very curious about that and intriguing. And I don't think it's something I'll ever get bored of. <laughs> yeah, that's, you can never get bored when you're working with children. That's for no. sure. I'm so, I'm so glad you, you brought that up because in the world of even teaching uh, in general education, uh, a lot of the people that are in that, that field will say, I just always gravitated towards working with children. It's, it's more of a calling than it is a job. We certainly don't do it for the money. And uh, right. it's just, <laughs> we just do it. Um, it's a calling. You have to, to be. Yeah. I always you know, say I, it's, I, it's part of my just life. It's not what I yeah. do. It's not necessarily my job. It's part of my life. Um, exactly. My life is part of early childhood education and early childhood education is part of my life. There's no off switch. You don't stop being an educator at four o'clock because your shift is done, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so true. It's always on, even when you're out shopping and you see children, you just automatically switch into educator mode. That's so funny. Um, can you mention, because you, you've kind of done a, a, a wide spectrum in the field, uh, mm -hmm. touching on, on all sorts of different uh, Uh, job and job positions uh is there a defining moment where you knew you needed to make a to give a 
kind of like an active contribution to how we see the world of child the early childhood education, a lot of people not quite sure where we stand as educators. So uh, when was there a defining moment where you say, no, I'm, I'm going to actively um, participate in changing how the world sees us as educators? Absolutely. Uh, so I've been known to be uh, an advocate on this subject on a, you know, <laughs> <laughs> regularly an advocate for, you know, just uh, our recognition and, and, and our pay and all of that, but just generally that the public sees us as more than a babysitter. We're not babysitters, right? We are educators. We educate. We know the development of children. We are people who are very in tune to these kinds of things and, and can help parents and community at wide help raise (laughs) healthy, well-rounded children. So, um, as, as far as a defining moment, I think that it would have to be, you know, so sometimes uh, you have to go low and over in order to <laughs> climb back up that mountain. But I think uh, having a burnout myself and seeing the burnout rates in, in yeah. the sector uh, kind of shook me up at one point. And I went like, this, you know, I was supervisor uh, in a in an early childhood center and burning out and everyone around me was burning out and I'm going like, what is wrong? Why is this the impossible job? You know, what, why is this? So I've, I, I feel like I didn't know it then, but now in retrospect, yeah, that's the defining moment where it's like, how can we make this better? How can Mm -hmm. we make the sector better mental health wise for our edge? good you know people to look up to uh, for this next generation if we're not taking care of ourselves so a lot of my work these days consists of creating resources to make this sector better to to talk a lot of a little bit more about that mental health stuff to on a personal note and on a professional note just put it out there uh, a lot more and I think by showing what we're made of, it's changing it, it slowly, but surely. I think the pandemic also helped with that, but seeing the role that educators play in not just a child's life, but a community's life and, and being recognized for that hard work and, and that role we play. Yeah. And you really touched on something important there, that, that impossible job. I love that you put that because I didn't have a word for it, but now I do. (laughs) It's the impossible job. It's the impossible job. And we keep saying something needs to change, but it seems like nothing is changing. And like like yourself, I I did have to go through a burnout. I had to hit rock bottom to realize, okay, no, there's something I can do. Because it seems so overwhelming to say we can't change this but we can with one person at a time. So I just, that's why I love watching what you do because, you know, you reach out, we are talking about it, which we never used to is saying we need support and it's, it's got to get better. And yeah. And we have pandemic, to talk about it. Yes. Like, I exactly. think the first step, you know, we keep saying things have to happen. Well, in order for things yeah. to, to happen, we have to talk about it. We have to say, Hey, we're burning out. Hey, we need resources. And yeah, If we don't have those conversations, nothing will change. I think that's the first step is to have these open convos. Because when I say it's the impossible job, it's not the impossible job in the sense, like, I'm just going to explain the the weight of the job for me (laughs) was maintaining all these relationships when you think about it. Okay, you have the relationships with the children, you have the relationships with their families, you have the relationships with the community, you have the relationships with your staff, you have, and in order to, to, to support all of those relationships, well, you don't also have time for the paperwork, the ministry, the this, right? Like, it's the impossible job. So how can we make that better to make the whole sector just generally better? That's right. There's only so many hours in a day. And uh, mm-hmm. at one point, we just run out. We can't do exactly. it all. And yeah. I love that. And you did mention the pandemic. And I think there's quite a few people who realized what we go through once they had to stay home mm-hmm. and, and and be with, with the family. Um, and we often talk about the negative side of the pandemic. A lot have happened. But I like to kind of switch that up <laughs> and ask you um, Are there any positive changes that you've seen in the last two, three years where the pandemic kind of forced us uh, 
to to change things and to look at things differently. Can you can you think of anything absolutely. positive that came out uh, of that? Oh, absolutely. There's lots of positive. I think that uh, the pandemic also gave us a break. There was a lot of creativity that happened, a lot of innovative stuff that mm-hmm. came out. I mean, um, pre-pandemic, it was very hard to reach our educators and to offer them any kind of of workshops or of professional development, uh, you know, with the advancement of Zoom and being able to do this virtually and all of that, it's not the perfect solution, but we're able to reach a lot more people and get a lot more infos and and book studies and conversations going with people all over the place. I think Mm -hmm. there's been a great exchange between like provinces and, and even around the world of practices and stuff because we have more access to all of this wonderful information. I also also think that educators are finding their voice like we're having this conversation today we're not the only ones having these conversations and I feel that it's not conversations that were happening 10 years ago (laughs) so I think slowly but surely people are finding their voice and going okay this is what we deserve this is this is how we want to move forward this is how we want to be seen Mm -hmm. and and I think those are all positive steps in the right direction absolutely We're also not talking about a a, a sector that's that old in the Mm -hmm. sense that I really realized this. I did a, I did a, one of my interviews with people who were at the, who were there at the beginning of when um, like childcare became a public service. And Mm -hmm. we're only talking about like, you know, 30, 40 years ago at most that this became so we're in a wave of change and, but really it's the first wave of change in this sector because we're yeah. a relatively young sector. That is so true. I think uh, even our generation probably was one of the first ones who were introduced to after school programs or childcare or going to school for kindergarten. But when it was introduced and uh, Ladies, that's a good point, like late eighties. Yeah. Late eighties. Uh, that daycares became like a thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so much has happened since that there is a need for a change. It's not the same reality as back in the day. (laughs) So families need additional resources. They need something different and the staff to support them. Well, they need it. They need also an update on on what they're, they're being recognized as. Exactly. Um, Yeah. I know you as do much as things changed, it. as much as things th- change, they say, stay the same. So there's some yeah. pieces that need to move because they haven't, right? We need to progress and and bit with the yeah. times, but other stuff, it like it's still some of the same problems we've had since 1980. That's so, so it, true. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think so. that's probably a positive side of the pandemic is. Uh, in, in a certain sense, is people were resisting change, but now we were kind of forced to make some of the changes. So there was a little bit, but yes, you're right. It's still kind of, well, we've always done it this way, so let's keep it up. But uh, it's not it's not a reality anymore. <laughs> so, exactly, yeah. Uh, I know you you talk a lot of, or you do a lot of work on well-being, um, mental health awareness, uh, especially for both children, but for adults as well. We both kind of have to be attuned to that. So uh, it, with your experience and, and everything that you've witnessed and you've gone through, um, what do you think there's things that w- we should be taught at an early age um, just to help you know, if we could say, what could we teach, be teaching young children uh, so that they could be more attuned uh, to their mental health and the needs that they would have later on? Yeah, um, I, that's a great question. Um, I feel like if you're from my generation or older, uh, we were taught a different way, right? Like mm-hmm. we weren't taught to identify our emotions. We weren't taught to uh, re- like respect our emotions in a certain way. Like, right, you're almost like, yeah. Um, asked to turn them off or to like, that's enough crying, you know, those kinds of approaches. Mm-hmm. And I think most of us, if you're raised in the seventies, eighties, nineties is all kind <laughs> of the same approach at different degrees. Um, and I think that what we're doing right these days is, is that right. We're really from a very young age and I think it needs to keep going and we need to be doing more of it, but at a very young age, we're teaching how to identify emotions within ourselves there we're creating resources you know Mm -hmm. 
as, as many as we need, but we're, right. we're getting there. So what do I think we should be teaching them is emotional regulation is how to identify that is self-confidence is mm-hmm. how to be kind, like just how to be kind and how do we teach that by doing it ourselves, right? Like we are the models. Um, mm-hmm. So I think those are the kinds of things that need to be, they're, they're first and foremost. Yeah. You don't know how to be kind. Uh, another thing is like just how to take um, criticism or not even criticism, mm-hmm. but just uh, um, on my French coming out, la rétroaction, you know, like how to. <laughs> yeah, like how feedback, to, yeah. <laughs> How to, because that's hard. You're going to take someone is going to tell you, like your boss or your teacher, or for the rest of your life, you're going to be, you know, given feedback. There is the word given feedback. And how do you take that? I know that me as an adult, like I had to learn how to take feedback. It's not something I learned as a child. And that's something you, if you, if no one can give you any kind of feedback, how are you going to grow? Right. So, and dealing with the emotions attached to getting those kinds of feedback. So it all comes back to emotional regulation, recognizing emotions, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and developing those strategies so that you can be a well-rounded adult who doesn't crumble at the, you know, the minute your boss tells you, "Mm, you could have done better. That's right. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they don't like you. If there's that feedback, whether it's positive or negative, it doesn't mean that the person hates you. They just, exactly. They want you to be better. And why wouldn't you want to be better? So yeah, that's great. And uh, you you really hit it on the head there with saying, this isn't taught at school. And that's why we, we need to integrate this. It's not something that we need to learn in therapy once we're adults to figure out. Yeah. It, if we did this early on, we'd make it so much easier for our children to cope, especially with the realities um, that they're dealing with now that we didn't have. Um, so yeah. that's, uh, that's a, it's a good start. I know we mentioned, because we, we, we talked about this before, um, and I've seen it more and more uh, in the families that I work with, but when we're talking about a loss, mm-hmm. um, and it, a lot of people will associate loss to mourning, like there was a, a death, mm-hmm. you know, somebody passed away. But for children, a loss can be as... Um, trivial if we could say I don't like that word but it could just mean we've changed our schedule or yeah uh, oh yeah you know they they we changed their shoes because they got you know a size bigger Uh, so it doesn't have to be as dramatic as uh, this person is gone forever but it's just we've had a change and to them because of the, the way their brain functions it's a loss um so, and how we teach them to go through that loss has an impact on them later on in in, oh, in life so what are your experiences with that challenges and what kind of advice could you give parents on recognizing that it's a loss they're not just being um mm-hmm. difficult uh, yeah oh absolutely emotion. yeah I have some <laughs> this is more my m- mom hat now at this point uh <laughs> but I I've been through right I have two two young boys um and we're I mean we're lucky enough to not have lived any huge losses in our life uh but just because you haven't had a huge loss like you know someone in your family passes away god forbid or something like that doesn't mean that the child doesn't live mini grief and mini um yeah loss uh, every day and i mean it took me a while to understand that that's what was going on with my son at one point um and then once i did i mean i was able to then go look for strategies and whatnot and i mean i do this for a living but I had to, and I ended up having to go consult. Um, it was uh, my, my youngest was mourning the loss of his daycare. He was going to school and daycare was over. And uh, the, the kind, wonderful lady that had um, taken care of my children for many, many years uh, was retiring. And she closed, you know, she sent the last little troop off to school and, and <laughs> closed her daycare. And my son went through many months, actually, of mourning, but it took me a while to realize he was grieving a loss. He was grieving a loss of that routine. He was grieving the loss of that, that 
you know, his, his educator that he had had for all of those years, uh, she was still around, but it wasn't the same for him. And he was very angry with us. So, I mean, what seems like you said it earlier, sometimes trivial to us that he yeah. was going through a big, this was huge for him. So, you know, as much as I've got every resource under the sun and access to everything, <laughs> it just, it's not the same when it's your own. And I think that it's as so educators true. or teachers or whatever, we seem to think like, I should have these, so, this solution. Mm-hmm. I should know, you know, I do this with 26 kids in a classroom, but I can't do it with my own. And I think we need to forgive ourselves for that. I think yeah. that that's how it works. You know, the mm-hmm. strategy that worked on your 26 <laughs> students isn't going to work on your own child. It's just, <laughs> just the way it is. The world works. <laughs> so I had to get over that and I ended up consulting, um, yeah, a psychotherapist and just kind of like, Hey, here's what's going on. I consulted her twice. She was able to kind of, uh, guide me through that explained it to me. He's grieving like this child is grieving and here's how you can support it. So it was a lot of just like, you know, stuff like reminiscing or talking about, or when he brought her, when he brought up the situation, just, um, greeting the emotion as it was helping support him through that and, and re- instating this like confidence in us that like we didn't tear the like look we love you right right? like because it was like this it was our fault right in his little head that this was happening so I mean that was a big one actually that's a big loss sometimes they're not that big right sometimes it's okay you're four and it's you know we're done with soothers (laughs) right Um, Right. Like, yeah. okay, we're, you, you know, or you lost your blankie. Like, you know, I don't know about you guys, but my kids have blankies. And I know that if a blankie gets left at camp one night, or if they ever lost their blankie, let me tell you, it would be a, a whole oh, yeah. week. Yeah. That's, that's something big. The blankie or a favorite teddy bear or, you know, their spot. Yeah the favorite spot on the yeah. couch yeah <laughs> and uh, I yeah. remember my oldest it was exactly that situation he was four he still had a soother and uh eventually he was like okay like and he was he was playing you know what I mean like he'd hide yeah. the, so- the soother so that we'd have to find it before bedtime like you know he was playing games so it was time mm-hmm. <laughs> if you're old enough <laughs> to hide the soother in order to prolong bedtime it's time to get rid of the soother. yeah exactly <laughs> so uh he got rid of the soother did a whole thing he knew exactly what was going on you know we handed the soother to the baby cousin right it's his soother yeah. now all of that he was well uh like grieving and and you know sobbing going he'd be good all day when it was bedtime and he'd realize oh soother has gone Oh, mm-hmm. he would just—he—he he called it sis. So he would like cry and sis, sis, sis. And so for four nights, you know, I'm like, and at one point, my husband's like, "Okay, how long are we gonna do this for? Like, rub his back while he cries, sis, sis." And I'm like, he just lost his best friend, his his mm-hmm. confidant, his security blanket, his. For us, yeah. it's just a soother. For him, it's a huge part of his world. For the last four years, this is like what got him to sleep. So, I mean, yeah. Is it annoying sometimes? Of course. Do we get, (laughs) you know, out of patience? And of course. Oh, God, yes. (laughs) Right? Like, of course we do. But then I just put myself in, how big is this for him? You know, for me, it's this big. For him, it's this big. So his emotion is, is warranted and all I can do, my job isn't to shut that emotion down. My job Mm -hmm. is to say, all right, you're living big emotions and I'm here if you need me. And I hope your big emotion passes soon, but if it doesn't, I'll be here anyways, you know, (laughs) (laughs) you know, it's not without saying I am very realistic in that sense of like, being a parent isn't always great. Like sometimes it's, Mm -hmm. it's annoying. Sometimes it's tiring. It's like, I I don't have patience. Like, yeah, I have patience on a good day. So like, (laughs) 
<laughs> and it's good to mention that, yeah, because a lot of parents come to us for advice and we have all the advice, but if only they knew <laughs> that we're going That's to the, the exact thing. same thing at home. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I can sit here and give you strategies all day. It doesn't mean that they're going to work with my kids. So mm-hmm. I think we have to be kind to ourselves. And I'm like saying this message as I'm also taking it in, because I think we do mm-hmm. be just kinder to ourselves as parents, as educators, yeah. just as people it, that have kids around them in any capacity, like it's not easy raising kids. Um, yeah. But I think that we can tap into a little bit more compassion and maybe find a little bit more patience or whatnot if we can see it through their eyes. If we can see that loss, yeah. that little loss for me is gigantic for him. Right. So it makes it easier to swallow and easier to be there. It's a, and to kind of calm ourselves down to say, oh, yeah, I forgot. It's just like if we were living a big emotion and somebody would say, well, it's not a big deal and calm down. That usually triggers. Yeah, right. No one <laughs> in the history, out. no one in yeah. the history of calm down has ever calmed down. Has before. ever calmed down. That's right. And that kind of leads into my next question because we we're kind of talking about it now. But uh, what advice or tip would you give to parents, teachers or educators on how to guide a child? Like, let's say, OK, this is happening. I'm I'm aware that this may seem like nothing to me, but it's a big deal for the child. How can you guide them through um, to kind of reassure them that this this will pass and it'll get better? Um, I very much feel like we're these children's thermostat in a sense mm-hmm. and they will follow our rhythm if we are frantic if we hop in if they're high and we jump into their high attitude high energy right. they will increase if when they go high we go low usually they'll come meet you at least halfway mm-hmm. so if i go back to your question with of, of advice and tips I, I did go into it, you know, just be kind with yeah. ourselves, realize we're not going to do everything perfectly. Yeah. Like everyone has then- a reason to go to therapy when they're 30 years old. It doesn't matter <laughs> who you are and how perfect of a parent, <laughs> every single person on the face of the planet will have a reason to go to therapy. Yeah. When they're 30. So, I mean, you know, you're not going to do things perfectly. <laughs> No, uh, but I like I like I like that analogy that you said about the thermostat is that our initial reaction will set the sense. tone for the rest of their lives. Yeah, because like you said, that, and I, I say this often, children don't listen to us. They watch us. So mm-hmm. if we react as strongly as they're they're looking to us for comfort. So if we're just stressing them out or belittling their emotion and making them feel bad for feeling that way, um, it's not going to help. But yeah, being that thermostat is okay, where do I need to, where do I need to gauge them? If they're going to follow me, then where do I want them to be? And this is where I need to show up. I think that's, that's a great way to start is taking um, notice of where you're at. <laughs> and yeah, engaging because them. often yeah. when I'm like, the kids are driving me crazy. Oh, they're either their energy is super high or it's very negative. There's lots of whining happening. I'm like, hold on a second. I'm pretty whiny right now. <laughs> and I've been pretty negative for the last two, three days. And, and all, and then if, once I become conscious of it, it's like, okay, it's not always easy, but like, let's turn this around and right there, they, they, they'll follow you. They just do. That's it, it, you. You're setting the tone. Uh, same thing in a classroom, right? Like if they're, the kids are all yelling and you start yelling at them, well, what are you doing? You're just contributing to the noise. Whereas <laughs> if you go low, they'll come meet you halfway. So yeah. yeah, I think that just, you know, I think reflection and self-reflection is a very, very powerful tool. Um, mm-hmm. It's, it's, I feel like what kind of got me to where I am today is always kind of reflecting on how can I do that better? How can I do that Hmm. differently? Uh, You know, analyzing that sometimes too much, but you know, don't we all? Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, like, I think it's listening to them. And also like, I just wrote an article on that in the, in the Voyage Art a few weeks ago, but when like helping support them through, 
uh, any difficult situation Mm -hmm. or even answering those difficult questions they have it's always about gauging where are they what do they understand where are they in their development what can they handle Mm -hmm. right when they're asking you a difficult question um throw it back like I always throw it back to get a gauge of like where is he at you know, right. and I use the example of uh, he asked me how the baby was going to come out of my sister-in-law's belly at one point. Mm-hmm. And like I was prepping for an anatomy <laughs> lesson. Let me tell you, I was just like ready for it. All right, buddy, we're talking about this. And uh, I just threw it back at him first, right, to see where he's at. And I said, mm-hmm. well, how do you think the baby comes out? And he says, well, it's a very little baby. So I think they make a very little incision and they take the baby out. And I was like, huh. Yeah, you're right. That is, that's one of the ways that they do it. There's other ways, but that's one of the ways. He was like, oh, cool. Do they get a scar? <laughs> and he was all about the scar. There was no anatomy lesson. There was no baby. <laughs> all of this extra info and maybe like stuff he wasn't ready for. If I wouldn't have just right. asked, hey, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think about that? And then you can gauge. You can gauge, okay, he's there. He understands this. We're going to go up to there this time. And next time I can add a little bit of info, but I'm not throwing stuff that can cause anxiety, that can cause, you know, (laughs) just stuff you're not ready to hear yet. Yeah, exactly. Or that I'm prepared for. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think gauging is very, very important in any, in loss, in in those hard questions, in any kind of anxieties yeah. these kids are living, especially post pandemic, there's lots of anxieties out there. <laughs> I think that yeah. we need to ask them where they're at before throwing stuff at them. That is a really, really good point. Yeah. To meet them where they are, not where you think they should be. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, that even works for adults, to be honest with you. Sometimes Absolutely. we, we can get ourselves out of so many situations if we just ask, okay, well, let's well tell what me what you think, think about this yeah. before I traumatize you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> I could talk to you about this all day, and I'm sure there's a lot of you we could do a whole episode just on that alone. But um, let's switch it up a little bit. Is there anything? Because you, you've got, you're busy. You're, you're, I'm you're busy. very busy. I'm busy. And, You know, is there something that you would like to share? And I'm putting you on the spot, but you don't have to answer if you don't want to. But anything you'd like to share with us, something um, that people don't know about you that you would like to share? It could be like a hobby or a talent or... I don't think the general public uh, would would know. Like my, I've written many, many kids books uh, Mm -hmm. that were just sitting in my journals. And uh, there's a fun fact. I have written in a journal every day since I was nine years old. Oh, wow. Oh, that's commitment. Wow. Yeah. And so to write these books, I've been going back into my nine, 10 year old journals. Actually, I I was just doing that. um, That is so cool. Actually. Oh, yeah. 1999. Look, 1999 (laughs) in there. So I've been going back through them. It's been a lot of fun. Um, And, and kind of pulling from those experiences as a nine and 10 year old to, to write, put in my books. So uh, eventually, eventually they'll, they'll go somewhere, but uh, yeah. Oh, that is fantastic. I'm so glad I got to ask this because I just learned something (laughs) incredible about you even more. Yeah, yeah. Um, wrote yeah been writing in a journal every day since yeah about nine I think my first journal is 1996 which I'm 87 so I was nine years old the the first one that I have yeah that's amazing and you kept mm -hmm. them all that's also an accomplishment that's not a lot a lot of people have keep them I I feel like there's probably a few from high school missing you know those high school uh years where you're like mad and might like throw one away or whatnot but generally yeah I have most of them that's right yeah we burn those (laughs) yeah those those difficult teenage moments there they they didn't make the archives (laughs) that's okay (laughs) I think the nine-year-old ones will probably be more fun anyway oh they're hilarious 
Like I'm constantly yeah. texting my sisters. Cause it's like, I had a fight with my sister da, da, da. and like, I'm sending them <laughs> pictures of these diary entries from 1996 and we're dying. Like it's hilarious. Oh, it's hilarious. Nine-year-old problems. <laughs> Seriously. And that's when you go back and say, okay, yeah, this is where I can help people <laughs> <been through it. laughs> Yeah, We've come a long way. Uh, yeah. Is there, um, is there any advice you wish you would have had sooner just to make your life easier? Is there something that uh, you wish you would have known earlier in your life? I think to just go for it. Like yeah. I, I hesitated many years I, you know, like this idea of books and, and, and stories I've had, mm-hmm. I've, oh, you know, you, you doubt yourself. You think that that's, that's not important. That's not even good to like that. Uh, and right. what I'm realizing um, is that no one can, no one will do the same thing as you the same way. Mm-hmm. So to just throw it out there and see what happens. And I feel like a lot of my projects, a lot of these, you know, I'm sitting here today with you because I just went for it. I started making YouTube videos and, you know, I I Mm -hmm. get to do this kind of stuff a little bit more now. I, I, you know, I did a little bit of public speaking uh, I've done, but it's always just like, um, just go for it and have confidence in what you're doing. Isn't Mm -hmm. done the same way as anybody else. So yeah, it's original and take a chance, throw it out there and see what comes of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so far it's gone, it's gone well for me, but I think that by also doing that, you're like, I, I, I hope that I'm serving as a good model to the children that are around me and seeing, take a chance, sure. have confidence and and take a chance and try something new and, and take your creative juices and try and create something with it like did I think that at you know 36 I'd be reevaluating my nine-year-old journals to be writing (laughs) books no absolutely not but you know sometimes you just gotta that's just where life brings you yeah something um so yeah I think just and and like I said earlier just uh being kind to ourselves and doing the best we can (laughs) We're never going to do yeah. a parenting or an educator job perfectly, but that's right. We can try. <laughs> we can try. We can try, but yeah, it, <laughs> which is some really good advice. Um, now, what uh, what's coming up next? You mentioned a few things, but uh, what's coming up next for you? What are you you know, if you could kind of share what your next project is or or your next goal that you like to work on yeah I would actually love to go back to school and get my bachelor's degree in either education or social work or something uh, I had started my bachelor's degree years ago and uh, never finished so I, I would really like that um, on a professional note I mean I'm uh, four years strong with uh, La Fisio and mm-hmm. uh, I don't plan on going anywhere the projects are always very interesting and uh, lots yeah. of stuff coming uh, that I, I can't talk too much about it but stay tuned no. you know um <laughs> i have you know my mes petites gens et pédagogiques and uh, mm-hmm. those will keep going and uh you know i plan on on keep creating because i also create les petites gens et pédagogiques are uh a official project but i also have on my youtube channel um just documentation of that I've done with my own family you know just to show development development and uh, we've explored like all the different types of risky play and those kinds of just informative little videos that I've done with my own family I plan on keep keep on doing those I mean uh kids are just so interesting and I love Mm -hmm. documenting so more of those to come um and yeah just I don't know we'll see where the wind takes me but uh that will keep you busy for a while yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. and watch out for those books I mean uh there's going to be books yeah. coming out follow me on Facebook and uh for all of the the new stuff to come the new stuff I'm so excited about those actually I can't <laughs> wait to see them but before we give them the information on where they can find you I always ask this question at the at the end of an interview and you working with children you'll understand it but uh uh the 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 very big question of what do you want to be when you grow up I, you know, for a long time, 
that the answer to that was uh like I, I've always had this fascination well you know musical theater all that yeah. but this fascination was just tv movies uh, mm. all of that so it used to be I want to be like a talk show host like I want to be uh, Oprah Winfrey <laughs> I want to be like a talk show host but right. I kind of feel like I am <laughs> mm-hmm Right, like I've gotten to fo- yeah. through my interviews and all of that. I kind of feel like I am a talk show host. It's, it's <laughs> I do not have a great studio. I mean, it's in my laundry room, literally. But it's uh, a start. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe one day I will have my own talk show. I have no idea. But I kind of feel like I'm fulfilling that dream uh, one YouTube video at a time. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. That's uh, that's what I love asking that question. Everybody has such a different answer, but mm-hmm. it always comes back to I'm I'm pretty much there. Like I'm pretty much want to be. Or I think that's yeah. amazing. And, and yeah, if- I, I consider you. Uh, 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 like a talk, a talk show, show like a, a public figure for yeah. early childhood education for sure <laughs> thank you that's that's, that's so fun, fun to hear I went to the social mm-hmm. last year and I was like I want to be I talk a host on this <laughs> show and they just announced one of the hosts is leaving I was like oh I should apply <laughs> There you go. It's open just for you. Can you imagine? Oh, that's that's funny. That would be so Um, cool. (laughs) When actually, it's funny uh, because when I reread one of my first, first journals at the beginning, it's asks, right? What do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. And it was a kindergarten teacher at eight years old. Yeah, eight, eight, nine years old or whatever. I had already written, I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. (laughs) That is amazing. You know, yeah. it's something that uh, in in uh, therapy, because I, I do have some some background on that, is one of the things that usually when you were trying to help somebody find their purpose or their passion, um, it usually boils down to that age group, you know, between the ages of seven to 12 is usually when you know exactly what you want to be. Yeah. And uh, you're right in it, right in the middle of it. That's so awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Now I could honestly, I could talk to you for days, but uh, we're going to have to wrap it up. Yeah. Now, how can people follow you, reach you, um, see, you know, what's coming up with the the wonderful work that you do or get the the resources that you you hand out there? I will add them to the uh, description of this uh, episode so that they can uh, contact you. But what's the best way to see uh, to, to see where you're at? Uh, yeah, so uh, my I'm most active on Facebook. So my Facebook is uh, Melanie McDonald, a P O E T O S. So E P E I T E S. Oh boy, that was not natural. Um, you have to do so, the switch to French for a minute there. <laughs> yeah, it's like when you know a phone number in English and then you try to say it in yeah. French or the other way around. Just yeah. it's not natural. And- those initials don't help with the the I being the E and the E being oh. the I. It, that's just, yeah. But I'll write it down. Lots of brain the power there. The, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So you can find me on Facebook. Uh, I post my, uh, in the summer, it's every two weeks. But during the, the year, the school year, uh, I post a video per week. Uh, so mm-hmm. they're posted on there. But they're also on my YouTube channel, uh, La Pédagogie avec Mélanie. Uh, oh. where everything for your French early childhood resources. That's correct. All right. I'll add those up and thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm really, uh, really glad you came on and this, you just, there's so much more that you could share with us, but, uh, that's why I invite everybody to go have a look. Um, really some nice stuff, easy to follow and uh, very simple to, uh, to listen and watch too. So thank you again so well, much you. for joining me today. And I'm sure we'll do this again. We have to. Yeah. Anytime, <laughs> so anytime. Fun. Yes. Too considering I want to be a talk show. I mean, I can talk. That's not a problem. There you go. We'll get you talking. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much. Danielle. Thank you. And for everybody watching or listening to this episode, uh, don't forget again to like, subscribe, and follow uh, both myself and Melanie. And uh, until then, stay safe, stay awesome, and we'll talk soon.